Before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. I'm really quite excited today because we've got something very interesting. Zach, you went off and found this one. What have you found? I have gone and found Professor Sonia Zakchevsky, who hails from the University of Southampton. We've had a few conversations about osteoarchaeology stuff and is just endlessly fascinating, frankly. She has an interest in biological anthropology, race, human diversity, and using human remains to understand things like migration, diet, identity, disease, and religion. She's written a whole host of articles and books. Check out her profile on the Southampton University website. Uh, but one of them includes science in the study of ancient Egypt. So I'm hoping at some point we can have you back to talk about some egyptian stuff. But today we're going to talk about the archaeology of disability, which, as Alex says, is every bit as fascinating as it sounds. So let's strip this right down to basics for starters. As an archaeologist, what are you able physically to class as a disability because there are certain conditions that today we would recognize as disabilities and I'm thinking here about things like mental health and connective tissue disorders and so on but as an archaeologist you can't necessarily see that in the remains so when archaeologists study disabilities what are you generally looking at? Well it's an interesting question Zach because there's actually a variety of different things we look at. So the first thing we start is by looking at the human skeleton and look at the body. Okay so when we're looking at disability we're starting to look at how the body interacts with the environment. So everything is context dependent. So now I wear glasses um, and so I'm not disabled but in the past I'd have been utterly useless and completely completely disabled. I cannot process any information without my glasses on. So in the past, I would have been a disabled individual, but obviously I'm not in the slightest bit disabled in modern life. So we need to be aware of the context in which we're working. In British law, somebody's only disabled if they're unable to do something for a year. But actually, if you think about people in the past, a year is not necessarily the right time scale. Because if you are a farmer and you've broken your leg and you're not able to work during the period when crops need to be collected, that would have an absolutely fundamental outcome to your long-term health likelihood. If you've got no food, you're not going to survive. So we, don't, we shouldn't think of disability in the past in the same way that we think about disability in the present. We should think about it in the way it impacts upon the individual and the people around them. So that brings us to the fact of how we look at it. So I'm a bioarchaeologist, I look at human skeletons, but I only look at them in the context of the material culture around them. And that includes the texts written about them, how they're buried, what they're buried with. So it's that way of thinking about these different things brought, being brought together. But that also means that things that are a disability now might not have been a disability in the past. So I said that being um, wearing glasses now is not a disability, but would have been in the past. But the inverse is also true. So if you think about something like dyslexia, Dyslexia is only a problem in modern situations because everything is done in written form. If you're working in a non, generally non-literate society, such as most of the population in ancient Egypt, being uh, dyslexic would not have been a problem. They wouldn't even realise they were dyslexic. And so it wouldn't have been recognised as a disability. So we have to think about what is normal and what is not normal. We also need to think about the time trajectory and how long things lasted for the individual and how that impacted on the whole of the population around. Let me just jump on the ancient Egypt bit for a second, because it's a pictorial writing system. So, as you say, no words. So you wouldn't get what we consider today to be dyslexia. But is there a kind of phenomenon of struggling to process images? Does, does that exist? And did that kind of have an issue? Was that an issue in ancient Egypt? That absolutely exists, um, but unfortunately we have no idea whether it was an uh, issue in the past. We certainly don't have any evidence in the ancient Egyptian medical texts that they recognised it as a problem. They recognised all sorts of weird and wonderful other things, and basically if you were female, you are pretty much guaranteed to have something um, that was a problem that they always put down to the wandering womb. If in doubt, it was toothache of the womb or the wandering womb. Um, the classic hysteria type thing going on again but it certainly exists in Egypt in a much earlier period in that sense 
Why am I not surprised by the casual misogyny? Yeah, just the casual chauvinism, yeah, the wandering woo. Uh, yeah. Blame my bad mood this morning, not on England, but on the wandering woo. Uh, anyway, so for the purposes of your research then, how do you, I mean, it sounds like a minefield, how do you define where is the line between a disability and an impairment? Well, I think the thing to think about is actually what those two words mean. So the impairment is the thing that is physically wrong or different about the individual. So it might be being a dwarf. The disability comes on whether it actually, that actually impacts upon you and the people around you. So in that sense, my impairment is having short sight and astigmatism, etc. But I have no disability because I have a corrective mechanism in wearing glasses. So I wouldn't have a disability, but I have an impairment. So we need to be aware of the difference between these two things. And this builds down to two ideas of um, disability. So we have a medical model and a social model. And very much in archaeology, we kind of tend to focus primarily on the social model. So the medical model is the kind of medical diagnosis, the what is wrong with this person? What is different about this person? Why are they unusual? Whereas in archaeology, we are basically interested in people and what it means to people. And so we very much follow the social model about trying to kind of go, OK, well, there's something that's different about this individual. How did it impact upon them and how did it impact upon the people around? Did they have a way of dealing with it? Did they splint the broken bone and so the person was still able to use their arm? Did they use a crutch and was therefore still mobile? And in that sense, we can think about it in terms of, you know, if you're an Anglo-Saxon from the Anglo-Saxon period, sort of the Saxon period, um, the, the matter was whether you could actually ride your horse and act like a man. If you weren't able to do that, you were disabled, whether or not you actually physically could do that or not. So it's, that's the kind of difference between impairment and disability. I'm listening to this thinking, I have many, many impairments. And I'm starting to wonder <laughs> to what extent. Like that's it. just social impairments as well. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even got started on the physical We're historians, stuff. we all have social impairments. That's why we all hang out together, because nobody else gets us. <laughs> well, this, was, this was one of the things that intrigued me, because uh, I first got interested in the kind of aspects of disability when I had my second child. Now she's got a congenital heart defect. And so I was told that she was kind of on the disability kind of trajectory if she didn't have heart surgery. And yeah, well, she would have died if she hadn't had heart surgery. But I just laughed and went, because she's not disabled. She's a baby. She doesn't move. Babies, <laughs> my older one. Yeah, they don't move. So the fact that she didn't have the heart ability to be able to crawl wasn't a problem because she yeah. did all the normal things that babies do. So she, well, to me, wasn't at all disabled. I'd love um, to see you having the historian argument with a medical professional about that. That would be anthropological argument. It'd be like an episode of Bones where she used to just waffle on and people would be like, what are you talking about? Uh, Zach, can I just check? Did you harass the living daylights out of Sonia for your Spanish Bones thing? Very, very slightly. And by very slightly, I mean a few hundred emails um, <laughs> and a couple of hour long meetings in her office. <laughs> Oh, it's all about the bones. Follow Zach on Twitter. You'll find out about the bones. He's slightly obsessed. Uh, Just a little I, bit. I really want to know. So before you came on, I'm like really ignorantly. It didn't, I think maybe because there was the football going on and I was slightly distracted, was thinking, well, how do you even know if someone's disabled unless they're like buried with a wheelchair or a walking frame or whatever? But obviously there are skeletal things as well, aren't they? How, did, do you, how can you tell um, from like, I'm, I'm really interested in the biological link how you tell that people had a disability, but also as well, can you tell how people reacted to disabilities in ancient civilizations? Okay, well, the actual identification of disability is, is problematic, but we can certainly recognize skeletal impairment. So mm. if you've got certain kinds of skeletal diseases, you will see a change to the body. So if you have leprosy, you can see skeletal changes around the face, uh, around the feet and hands. If you have tuberculosis, you can see things down the spine and the hips often in those kinds of joints. But even very basic things, if you've got severe osteoarthritis, you can have huge skeletal changes around whichever joints are affected. And we can start looking to see how those, that joint use has changed. Mm. If you start having a lot of um, pressure put on the joint, you'll start developing new bone in that area and sometimes the bone rubs against the other bone and it gets all shiny and we can see that that is classic osteoarthritis. Mm. 
But also we can see it with things like where you start losing teeth. You, you think about, okay, you start losing teeth, you've then got to start consuming your food in a different way because you can't yeah. chew it. So it's all those kind of things that link together. So, there are, there, so we start by looking at the skeleton and looking at the different bits. There are some things that will change through a life. So for example, when you break a bone, if you break a bone in childhood, it remodels and you often don't see it in adulthood. That's why children are so bouncy in that sense. They fall, they break a bone and they're back using that bone quite happily in a few weeks. Whereas if you're post 60 and you break, and break your uh, femur, your thigh bone, it will take months and months and months to recover. But at the same time, if, we, if you break that bone as an adult, we will probably see it in the archaeological record because you don't remodel the bone as much. Whereas if your child breaks their bone, you won't see it later on. So we can start seeing the kinds of things that might have happened. So we can see where people have had major accidents. We can see amputations. We can see other sorts of weird and wonderful things. So you can sometimes see nerve damage. And indeed, we can sometimes recognize you know, blindness or deafness where bone has closed a particular area where you know that we need to have a, a blood vessel or, an, uh, or a nerve going through. So we can sometimes see those kind of bony changes that tell us that that person has a skeletal impairment. What we can't see is how much pain it caused them and we can't see how badly it affected them. So we have to try and look at other proxies around the body to work that out or from the rest of the material culture around them. So for example, if somebody breaks their leg and they're then hobbling around, you might see crutch use, that you might find a crutch with them, that would be great, but actually what you're more likely to find is you actually start finding extra muscle development in their arms for having used those crutches. So we see the body reacting in different ways based on the kinds of activities that person does to cope with it. How do you know if they've developed more muscle somewhere else in their body though? Does that have a manifestation on the bone? Absolutely. So the more you use muscles, the more the muscle attachment grows or changes shape on the bone. So we can identify people who've really been using their muscles heavily by particular muscle changes um, in the texture of the bone and the size of the muscle attachments. It's not a one to one correlation with muscle size, but it's the fact that if something gets the muscle where the muscle attaches to the bone gets bigger and more rugged shows that they have used those muscles more but we can't say exactly how much more but you can certainly recognize people who've developed big shoulder muscles and things from using crutches and stuff so so i mean what do we know about attitudes towards the disabled within ancient civilizations because i have this half memory probably based on primary school knowledge which is clearly nonsense that spartan society they abandoned weak babies in the wild because they wouldn't survive and Spartan society, oh so macho, et cetera, et cetera. Is that kind of thing accurate and kind of talk us through how things are, are different in different societies? Because obviously not everybody's gonna be the same in terms of their attitudes. And presumably kind of the context, as you were saying, of the disability matters. So for instance, if it's a war wound, that perhaps, and I'm guessing here, is kind of seen as a badge of honor. So talk us through the whole thing. So I think that's the one of the things that's key is it depends on the society you're looking at and they're very different. And yes, there is evidence that the Spartans did expose their babies and see who survived. Certainly, there is no evidence that they threw weak, weak babies off cliffs. We have areas where there are bodies found that you might think might be where they would have fallen, but none of them are babies. So definitely that wasn't the case. Um, but we certainly have texts that suggest that they did this. But obviously we can't tell because children children grow into adults so only if we were to find lots and lots of babies would we know we haven't archaeologically found lots of babies the other thing is that baby bones are very small so tend to not be preserved very well in the archaeological record we do find babies in other situations we've got you know, in roman context you find babies elsewhere what we do find is that in different societies people are treated very differently so for example in egypt dwarves were thought of very positively they weren't thought of as, as, as something negative. And in fact, we can think of um, particular dwarves were given ceremonial roles. So we obviously think of the kind of classic court jester, but they were also given other roles within the royal court. So they would be yeah, the chief governor or um, dedicated to education of the pharaoh's children. Peter the Great did all that as well. He used to travel everywhere with a pet dwarf on his lap. Exactly. So they were, they were sort of thought of as very positive. Mm. And indeed, in Egypt, we also see situations where people were depicted as being blind um, is a way of depicting them as particularly religious or pious. So, for example, 
we have um, things like uh, the person called Raya, who was who directed the choir, and he was depicted as blind uh, when he was uh, playing music for his two patron deities, um, Ptah and Hathor, but he's depicted as sighted in other situations. So actually we think he wasn't blind, but therefore being blind was considered as a way of being closer to the gods. And so therefore he chose to be depicted as blind because that made him a kind of better, more pious, more virtuous person. So in that sense, the, each society, each uh, culture around the world has different contexts of what they thought of as being particularly important and whether it was relative, um, whether that particular so-called disability, impairment or difference was a positive or a negative to them. And so with the war wins, I mean, am I right that, you know, if you have lost an arm to war or a leg, then that's something quite honourable. Do you even have like disability pensions for, oh, I'm just going mad with my imagination here. Talk us through it before I start. Sadly, wild. you're in a room with two military historians, so someone mentions war wounds and we're like, ka-ching! <laughs> well, certainly we have evidence that in certain groups there is evidence that uh, injuries that have occurred in, in battlefield situations are viewed very positively. And indeed, I've had a student who was looking at the skeletons from the Mary Rose, uh, looking at you know, the injuries that they might have received and trying to look and see whether the injuries they received could be treated with the knowledge of the medical treaties of the time and what was in the actual medical chest found uh, on the Mary Rose. Certainly in other situations, we see individuals being buried with almost like a kind of prosthetic to replace what has been lost in battle. Uh, so particularly during um, sort of early medieval periods, in particularly religious, some religious groups, you'll find an extra bit of limb being added where a, a part of a body has had something amputated in war. But it's hard to tell because we don't often clearly have individuals for whom we know that they died in war, except the individuals who had died on the battlefield. And so if they died immediately at the time, it obviously wasn't a very, it was glorious in one way, it was not very glorious in another because there wasn't a sensible body to deal with afterwards. There wasn't a, a better way of actually burying them afterwards. But for example, in Egypt, we have um, individuals who were buried with prosthetics to replace whatever they'd lost in life. But obviously we don't know if those were battle injuries or just accidental injuries. My particular favorite is the, there's particular common things is to have prosthetic toes replaced. Um, is this where you go to the next life hole? Yes, because oh. you, you want to be perfect for the afterlife. And this way you can be perfect is by having a prosthetic to replace whatever it was that you'd had amputated. Uh, and indeed, the some of the prosthetic big toes that have been studied, um, some of them have wear on the bottom of the leather to make up the toe. So that meant it was actually used in life. But mm ones are new as if they've been buried with their best for the afterlife so it's like being buried with your Sunday best I've got my best toe ready for the afterlife so I'm complete <laughs> the afterlife. I'm guessing if someone's had a prosthetic limb so say they've had a, a leg below the knee or something then you'll see the wear on the skeletal remains won't you so you're even if the prosthetic isn't with them you can tell they wore one. Absolutely you can see you can see the amputation and you can usually see the other changes to the body that tell you that, that they had something going on. You might or might not be able to tell that they had a prosthetic, but you can tell how they reacted to it, or you can see that they didn't, for example, have some other thing going on. So they didn't have the muscle attachments elsewhere, or they did have bigger muscle attachments in certain situations. So we have, for example, there's a classic uh, Scottish sailor um, who is in the collections in uh, Edinburgh, who had an enormous, um, basically an infected thigh and uh, he basically put the so when your bone gets infected it swells up and grows to a bigger size and obviously the best way of dealing with this is to try and clean out whatever is causing the infection on the inside well basically what he did when, whenever he went to sea he poured seawater into his leg sloshed it around inside his bone and then yeah tipped it out and then stuck a bung in the side of it so you've got bone with a great big bung in the side of it and yeah this guy was hardy because he kept going that leg was getting bigger and bigger but actually it was a pretty effective treatment because um, the, the salt would have killed off an awful lot of stuff. Well, I bet Henry the Ape's thigh bone is a wreck as well. <laughs> well, I just think these people must have relied on an awful lot of alcohol to get through the pain. Um, and there's definitely some individuals who I see in the collections and I think I would not have wanted to have met on a dark night. <laughs> <laughs>
isn't there's a pirate at Edinburgh as well? I was talking to my friend Carolyn Day about this because she's actually up there now and she does the history of disease and stuff, but she does more Georgian stuff. And they they do have a pirate as well, don't they? I'll take your word for it. I've looked for it at the collections recently. There's some fantastic things in their collections up there. Yeah, I think we're going to try and do an episode from there at some point to talk about because they've got um, Burke as well, haven't they? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, they've got some very interestingly sourced collections and some interesting individuals in there. Um, in the same way that uh, the Hunterian Museum in London has some unusual things like the giant who wanted to be buried at sea so that he, yeah, and doesn't, his family doesn't want his body on display, but it's still on display in the museum. So it's got some distinct, there are a few of these kind of skeletal collections that are definitely ethically problematic and especially so when they're then displayed to the public, potentially against the family or the individual's own wishes. Uh, we are going back to our freak show episode, aren't we, Zach? We're also heading straight into my territory with my charity and those Burgos bones. But yeah, absolutely. The whole kind of culture surrounding the display of human remains, particularly, absolutely. but also that decision making process is it's really complex um, and it's it's a really hard one to to find. For me, it's if it's monetized, if it's there for study and it's there for education for people to look at. But if you're charging people and it's entertainment, is that the line? But it also, I think, particularly is where disability comes in, because often people choose to display uh, or show off the unusual or the weird, which basically turn it othering individuals. Whereas in the past, those individuals were not necessarily othered. They were just considered on the continuum. Mm. So we can tell that from how they're buried in the archaeological record. So whether they're buried in the normal way for the individuals in the rest of the cohort. So, for example, um, one of my students has been looking at a Roman dwarf from... Um, from Dorset uh, and she was just buried with the other individuals mm. she, yes she died at a relatively young age but as in childhood she'd have grown and looked completely normal until she became a sort of early teenager and then it would have been obvious that there was something different and potentially wrong about her in that sense but the way she was buried was completely normal so she was considered a full member of society so if she was to be put up on display as a weird, something odd is that right she has a very unusual form of dwarfism so yes it is in that sense very educational but the people at the time considered her a completely normal member of the community so they considered her a completely full at least archaeologically it looks like they considered her to be a completely full member of the community and they gave her normal burial rights and, and the like. I mean there's also a race element in there isn't there because traditionally Sorry. indigenous population. My phone just rang. Right. The ringing right. phones to start that one again when you're ready, Zach. In fact, I even can tell my blooming husband it just called. It was like, I hung up on him. <laughs> Go away, I'm busy. <laughs> but also, there's a race element in there, isn't there? Because traditionally, indigenous populations were put on display. And so you've also kind of got to factor that into that what you're talking about that sense of othering. And this is something that we need to scrutinize and peer at as opposed to considering a part of society more broadly. Absolutely, it's this idea of basically having a, almost like a human zoo on display and this idea of, you know, these are, we are normal, these are the others, they are odd, they are different, as opposed to recognising the range of human diversity and the fact that everything is so situationally dependent and context dependent. And so I always, for that same reason, I always find it hard because I never know what button to tick on the, you know, ethnicity bits, you know, because where do you decide what the boundaries are? And this idea that you have to fall into a box. And that's exactly the same when you're putting on display. Well, different parts of anybody's body are gonna look different. You know, uh, if we look at Michael Phelps with his enormous feet, you know, those are distinctly abnormal, but they're great for swimmers, but they're distinctly abnormal for the normal person. Which part, yeah, do you think we should have the entirety of his body on display? You know, what do you think? Yeah, how do you decide what is right or wrong? I think it's very, situational in that sense there is no clear line can i ask you talked about the roman dwarf in dorset and that how how does that compare with the remains of dwarves found in egypt well it was interesting because the one in dorset has a very specific form of dwarfism that is extremely rare so she had a form of dwarfism that basically only affects parts of the body whereas most dwarfs in Egypt are usually the standard achondroplastic or pituitary dwarfs, which are the two kind of main forms of dwarfism that exist. 
And so we don't actually have, so this particular one from um, Allington Avenue um, has Langer type uh, dwarfism. And I don't know of any other archeological examples of it. I mean, it's, it's like a, you know, there are about 20 individuals in Britain with the, with the condition now. So it's extremely rare in that sense. Um, whereas the forms of dwarfism that we usually find archeologically are the much more common forms of a chondroplastic dwarfism or pituitary dwarfism. So in a chondroplastic dwarfism, basically the breadth of the body stays the same, but the individual is shorter. So in that sense, they appear to be quite short and stocky, short and stout. Whereas pituitary dwarfism is basically everything reducing by proportion. So it's basically like looking like an adult body shape, but in a child size. So we can easily recognize that as being different from children because children have different body shapes. Because obviously if you think about a child, they've all got these really weird big heads. You just have to look at babies and their freakishly large heads. Um, and slowly, as you grow, your head gets to a, a normal, more normal size relative to the rest of your body as you reach adulthood. Um, and so pituitary dwarfs have the adult body shape, but in a much smaller size. Many, many reasons why babies freak me out. <laughs> I was going to say some people maintain having a huge head well into adulthood, but that's more a case of the individual <laughs> rather than... <laughs> certain celebrities spring to mind. Yeah, indeed. I think the other thing is that we have other situations where we can recognize um, weird and wonderful stuff. So, so there, are form, there are other things that are much harder to recognize, such as being blind or being deaf, because most of that is not gonna have a marker on the skeleton, but occasionally we will see changes to, um, to the body that uh, causes that. So in the collections here in Southampton, we have an individual who's got cancerous change around the eye. It's got huge amounts of bone cancer around the eye and will have actually it basically blocked off uh, the optic canal. So that individual would have been blind in that eye. And we can tell that from the amount of bone growth. But unfortunately, it's just one individual. And, it, and irritatingly, even more irritatingly, it's from a time period where, well, it came to the collections in a time period where people kept the weird and the wonderful rather than keeping the whole of the individual. So I don't even have the rest of the body to look at. So we can't even tell how that person was treated uh, in life because we don't have the rest of the body. And so there's certain problems with a lot of archeological collections where people kept the weird things or the perfect. Um, so they kept the idealized forms, which leads to a lot of the racism that developed in early 20th century archeology. span particularly when you're looking at Egypt, because um, a lot of the early Egyptologists were good friends with the statisticians who were developing these methods of classification. So they sent perfect examples of Egyptian skulls to Britain to the collections, but left the rest of the body and just sent the skulls. Um, here we have an example of a disease where the person who was doing the study at the time was really interested in the disease, but wasn't interested in the individual. So they've just kept the little bit of, that's diseased in the body and has left the rest of the person. And to me, I find that completely unethical because a person is a person. It would be like keeping just somebody's hand. You know, why would you do that? It's we've all heard about what happened in older hay and why we have the Human Tissue Act was for people keeping samples out of context. Well, that to me is an archaeologist doing exactly that about 50 years ago, which is when it came to our collections. But occasionally we do get things all together in context. So there's a well-known case of a little girl um, from Poundbury, Roman site uh, in Dorset, and she was um, profoundly deaf because we know that the bone in both her ear canals had basically, there was enough bone to block both ear canals. So although we can't say that she was completely deaf because it's possible that some uh, vibrations could have been transmitted through that bone she would at least have been very deaf and it would have had limited hearing but what was interesting there is that she was buried face down so she was buried prone so clearly she was not treated she was not given the standard burial so she was treated as something abnormal by society but she died age six which is not a common age for children to die children tend to die before during or before the weaning process or later on in life. So dying at six is not a common age for somebody to die. So is the reason she's been buried prone because she was deaf or because she died in childhood at a time where actually we tend not to lose very many children. So it's very hard to tell what that social difference with this individual really is. Is it her deafness or is it because she was a child who died at an unexpected time? 
I'm is, there any Max. is there any indication of what being buried prone would signify? Is, is this quite a rare thing? Being buried prone is usually a marker of being considered an outcast in some way, uh, of being considered abnormal or excluded. So people who were considered, um, who were thought to be criminals were often buried prone. Um, we have individuals who are buried prone who, um, yeah, it, it's, very, it's a very unusual burial rite. And indeed there are entire books on it because it's something that's clearly different to the norm. And so it's less than 1% of individuals who are usually buried prone. So it's definitely, it's a clear marker of something being different. But maybe it's right, so if, so say she was missing a toe, then you could stick a toe on, like you said they did, yeah. and yeah. she's ready for the afterlife. But obviously you can't, you can't give her new ears for the exactly. afterlife. So is, is the concept that she's sort of praying to be accepted in the afterlife or is it a nice thing or a nasty thing? Do we know? Exactly. We just, that's sadly the case. We just don't know. Yeah. And that's one of the things it'd be really nice to find out, you know, to find ways of trying to understand what's going on. But sadly, like that thumb up, thumb down gladiator thing that just bugs the life out of me. And you're just like, just somebody find the answer. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, because this child, yeah, I mean, she was about six when she died and there's nothing else that's wrong with her body. But that's not to say that she didn't, you know, fall off something, get a major infection and die all of a sudden or just refute, yeah, got some major virus and everyone kind of went, well, she looks really weird because of something else, you know, some major disease. Um, and they just kind of went, let's just get her out of the way and bury her prone. But but interestingly, when we get to the Saxon period, we have at one of the sites we have collected and you know, we have curated in our collections. We have an individual who's buried prone, but with a dog. And so there have been people writing, oh, isn't it sweet that he's been buried with a dog? It's so nice. And you're going to go, yeah, but it's also buried face down, which is not normally a sign of respect. And if you don't respect somebody, well, how would you bury them with a dog? Doesn't. So these ideas of how people are being buried, it's not easy to read. We definitely have to do an awful lot of interpretation and try to make sense of what else they're buried with. Because people make the choice of what you're buried with. The thing that to realise is, of course, the person who's buried doesn't make the decision. It's the people around who make that decision. So although we have all ideas about, you know, what we should do, you know, yeah. everybody, we hear right. about people writing their own funeral, planning what they want, but actually you have no idea, you're dead. You don't get any say in the matter. It could well be like, we're glad you're gone and take your stupid dog with you. Exactly, it's like that, that yapping dog has driven us yeah. nuts a bit bit now. Labour going, take that with you for a start. So it's that kind of weirdness where we try and, I think archaeologically I find it really intriguing because we're trying to match variation and patterning with variation in the archaeological record to see if that will tell us something about the actual individuals. And so is it the disability that's different or is it the fact that it impacted upon them in a certain way or, or were they just lazy and refused to take part in the general activity? No. So we have individuals who have things like um, curvature of the spine. For most of the people, that's really not going to have much of an impact because unless it's really major, it doesn't have a huge impact on you in Britain. But if you're living in Egypt, having curvature of the spine, it has a, it, although it still doesn't have a huge impact upon your lung capacity, if you're living in an area where you have sandstorms, that is going to affect your ability to breathe because you're now got to cope with sand at the same time. Sandstorms make it hard for anybody to breathe. So if you've got limited lung capacity, then that's going to have a bigger impact. And so maybe that will then impact upon how you're buried archaeologically. It hasn't been in the sites that I've excavated in Egypt. We don't see any difference, but who knows? Maybe, I mean, I would expect they would have been less able to work and to do the jobs that would have been expected of them, but maybe they could make up for it in other ways. Certainly um, colleagues who have been working in Cyprus have found individuals who they knew had limited mobility of their lower limbs because there were bones that were joint had fused together and so they were less mobile but they had grooves in their teeth and were buried with needles so a suggestion was maybe these people have turned into being spinstresses and actually have been uh, doing the sewing because you can do that sitting down and that's something that this society needs people making clothes so maybe instead of doing one job they've chosen to do a different job instead and actually the, the grooves in the teeth were where they're moving the thread through uh, a twisting thread to make it better. Interesting. It's a bit, sorry, the military one, but it's a bit like soldiers where they've got um, 
deformities in their teeth where they've been biting off um, the heads of cartridges. Okay. You mentioned leprosy, because I want to take this back to disability. You mentioned leprosy. What kind of burial do people with leprosy get? Because the whole point about sufferers with leprosy is that they're banished from society. So the fact that you find people who've been buried kind of struck me as quite surprising. OK, so we have obviously the burials associated with the various leprosaria. So the hospitals that people with leprosy went to at a certain period. And most of those individuals do have leprosy. Not all of them actually have leprosy. So, so maybe they had very mild form that we don't see skeletally. We don't see the genetic evidence of leprosy because we can diagnose leprosy not only from how the bone looks, but we can also take ancient DNA um, and mycolic acids, take small samples of them and do uh, analyses and see what form of leprosy they had or whether they did or did not have leprosy. So we certainly see individuals who don't have skeletal um, or genetic markers of leprosy who are buried in the cemeteries associated with these leprosaria. So that suggests that we weren't necessarily very good at identifying leprosy in the past. You know, and what's more, I would have thought that if you've been accused of being a leper by somebody, it's pretty hard to come back from in times. You, probably that might well have been the end of your social life and you are now socially excluded. <laughs> you might as well join the, the leprosarium and at least have a community around you. Um, but in our collections, we actually have the earliest recorded case of leprosy in Britain. Um, and this was just an individual who's buried in a very normal uh, early Saxon uh, grave, uh, complete with everybody else, buried as per usual. There is some slight potential, slight clustering of individuals who seem to have certain kinds of diseases, but we, it's not statistically significant, so we can't say that that's definitely what's going on. What was really interesting for this one was actually it's early Saxon, which at the time when we first recognised this in the skeleton, we were confused because it was before leprosy should have existed in Britain. Um, and actually that was how we ended up doing um, radiocarbon dating for it and discovered it was the earliest recorded case. And it's, an, it's a form of leprosy that's more common in the later medieval period in Scandinavia then we did some isotope analysis and discovered this person actually came from probably sort of northern Germany area and had migrated to England, in fact, an area underneath the M11. Um, and so it's so, so it was interesting seeing that this person had traveled and had brought leprosy with them. Um, I was bizarrely surprised by how well the media reported it because I had visions of the Daily Mail saying migrants bring leprosy to Britain but they actually <laughs> reported something interesting as opposed to those terrible if migrants coming over with their diseases. <laughs> so. Could it be social the lack of leprosy on some of the barrels in the could it be like if you're say your husband has it and you're exiled and you just don't want to leave your husband? Exactly I mean you know people are people people want to stay together so there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not we can recognize empathy uh, in the past and whether we can look at um, the caring of people in the past. Did people look after and show compassion? And it's been strongly argued that we can't really say anything about compassion because basically an individual who is severely disabled or deformed at birth, well they're going to survive because their parents look after them. Is that compassion or is that actually just called being a parent because you yeah. love your baby whatever? You know it's what is what's right and what's not right. And in that sense, we have we have even have Neanderthals who clearly had to ha had uh, many breaks in their bones and had to had lost their teeth, so they would have needed their food processed for them or cooked or turned into a pulp. But maybe everybody just ate their food that way because that's what that group did to hope look after Uncle Pete, you know, or Great Uncle Pete or Great Great Uncle, you know, who knows who we was. But you know, to kind of what is normal probably depends on what you deal with things around you. I think every family knows that every family who's got problems with people eating certain things will modify their diet around it. And I'm sure that that was exactly the same in the past. You, know, you coped with what you've got to deal with and whether you recognize somebody as disabled, I think it's probably unlikely you probably, that's just that person's being a bit different as opposed to anything else. This is fascinating. Um, if our listeners want to learn a bit more, because I know I do. So this is basically a self-indulgent, selfish question. Sorry, folks. Where, where, where do we start? What, what, what can we start to read on this? Well, there are a series of books about care and compassion in the past. So there's a book called Care in the Past. There's a book called um, Disability in Antiquity. Uh, they're both academic texts, but they're both kind of quite nice and accessible. And then even things like the very classic archaeology books, that, you know, the, the Archaeology of Health and Disease, 
talks about disability in the same way and people are starting to try to write about it in a more understanding way now in the hope future i hope you'll be able to leave, read some lovely kind of uh, stories written by some of my students because one of them the one who was looking at the roman dwarf um her, she's been working on developing fictive narratives as a way of communicating how these people might have lived in the past and hopefully she's just finished her phd so just finishing the corrections so hopefully you'll be able to read some of those when they come to be published and they're great basically linking the actual archaeology very clearly with a almost like a sort of um instead of being fiction you could call it faction or something you know it's basically a story that tells what they're experiencing based on very clearly the archaeology so look out for step open and rights work in the future that sounds absolutely fascinating. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us to give us an overview of, I know Zach and I have like a million more questions we could annoy you with right now, um, but this has been a brilliant overview of how you can look into disability using the archeological record instead of the historical. Because we've had a few historical episodes, haven't we, Zach? So this is good yeah, to, yeah. to balance it out. So thank you very much. Pleasure, it was great fun. Thank you very much. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.